History Channel, where the past comes alive. They tread narrow steel beams hundreds of feet in the air to raise the skyscrapers and bridges that define the American skyline. Theirs is a world where one wrong step can be their last, and sudden death is an ever-present fact of life. They are the iron workers who risk everything to pierce the sky with the monuments of the modern world. Meet the Skywalkers who walk the high steel, next on Suicide Mission. one of the world's most perilous jobs. Structural iron workers, like these men erecting a 400-foot San Francisco office tower at a rate of three floors a week, know the risks all too well. For hanging iron far above the ground in a death-defying dance with machinery and tons of swinging steel is an age-old combination that can spark fear in even the bravest men. First time you have to walk out in the iron. Man, my first job for, for the first two nights, three nights, and I had nightmares. I was waking up in a cold sweat. Because, you, you know, you're, I was 100, whatever, 100 feet off the ground. It doesn't matter after, you know, a certain height. There's nothing underneath you. If you fall, you're dead, and you know it. You gotta give 110%. If not, you're gonna, you're pretty much gonna die. I mean, if you want one slip, you know, you fall eight stories, it's all over. Grab it from that! The margin of error, especially on high steel, is next to none. If you're on a structural and something happens, usually you're dead or seriously hurt. Iron workers have a saying, uh, uh, the fall's not what kills you, it's a sudden stop. The wind blew my brother-in-law off the uh, bridge. The wind must have caught him and his partner, blew them right off the bridge. Anyways, my brother-in-law was killed, and my uncle was a superintendent. And unfortunately, the following week, he fell off. And uh, he was killed. Yeah. And that was my introduction to this business. Faced with these perils, the Iron Workers Union and the U.S. government have waged a hundred year war for safer work conditions. Thanks to life saving reforms, a modern iron worker can hope to enjoy a long career in high steel. But it wasn't always so. By the late 1860s, with railroads forging their way across the continent, wooden bridges proved too weak to support the huge trains that traversed them. An English invention called the Bessemer process made the steel production simpler and more affordable. The new alloy was quickly used to erect durable trestles throughout the country. Work on the towering new bridges was dangerous and challenged the tenacity of those drawn to the new trade of iron worker. Well, the type of individual who was usually attracted to this work was uh, probably the same kind of guy who would be uh, attracted to uh, being a cowboy or a lumberjack or a prospector, somebody with an adventurous spirit. They were called the cowboys in the sky and uh, this kind of stuck with our uh, iron workers. But early iron workers didn't have to go west to prove their mettle. The Brooklyn Bridge, begun in 1869, would offer a chance to work on the boldest engineering feat of the day. But before even the first tower was raised on the Great Suspension Bridge, the harsh work conditions began exacting a toll. Pneumatic underwater compartments called caissons were used to excavate a foundation for the towers. Deep inside them, men began collapsing in agony. They were getting cramps, they were getting pains, and after a while, some workers even died from this. Uh, they, they called it caisson disease. Chief Engineer Washington Roebling himself would be stricken by the mysterious caisson disease. Before it was realized that the men were actually experiencing a severe form of the bends, 
from working below the seabed. Later, during the hazardous task of stringing the steel wires that would form the great suspension cables, the bridge continued to claim ironworker lives. Men were regularly crushed by shifting cables or thrown from the towers or catwalk. After plunging from a 276-foot tower top, the water of the East River was as lethal as cement for the hapless victims. The exact death toll exacted by the bridge remains a mystery. The official record shows around 22 men, but unofficially it's 30 or 40 because quite often deaths went unreported at this time. In 1871, as the Brooklyn Bridge was still rising from the waters of the East River, the fate of the iron worker was forever altered by the flames that engulfed Chicago. Following the Great Fire of 1871, the city's determination to reconstruct with stronger, more fire-resistant materials helped trigger the era of the steel and iron building. With solid steel skeletons, the weight of a tall building no longer had to be supported by a massive exterior masonry wall that limited their height to a few stories. Freed from the limits of brick and stone, architects used iron to push their buildings ever higher. The vertical cities of the next century were set to burst skyward. For the iron workers of the era, the risks were rising as fast as the skyline. Little concerns are given to safety. Safety nets do not exist, safety belts do not exist, uh, harnesses, safety cables, none of this is in existence yet. If an iron worker loses his footing just for an instant, it's a good chance that it's fatal. Funerals for the young iron workers were alarmingly common events. The workers got together and said, look, we have to create some type of a large association in order to take care of the iron workers, uh, see that they have a decent burial when they've been killed on the job site. The Bridge and Structural Iron Workers International was founded in 1896. The fledgling Chicago local soon reported that one in seven of its members had been killed or crippled in accidents in a single year. In this era, natural death was, was looked on with suspicion. You know, if, if you were an iron worker and uh, you had worked a long career without having an accident, a severe accident, or, uh, um, or being killed, it was deemed that it maybe uh, you weren't doing your job, that you weren't sticking your neck out. With fear now as much a part of the job as the iron itself, an intrepid new breed of iron worker became instant legend. The Mohawk Indian had arrived on high steel. The 1880 construction of a Canadian National Railroad bridge on the Ganawaga Reservation outside of Montreal proved fateful. Mohawk locals hired for menial labor soon were casually walking the highest bridge beam. The reputation of the men from our community to do this kind of work was really started on that very first job. If we look at the records of people who were on the job, they talked about how it was like putting ham with eggs. The men didn't seem to have any fear of climbing up in the high steel. Rumors of an innate lack of fear in the Indians soon surrounded the Mohawk iron workers as they began appearing on construction sites throughout the Northeast. They always said that the Mohawks were able to walk the beams much easier than maybe others. Uh, you know, some say it was a myth. It wasn't a myth at all. It was just fearless of our work. They had no fear of height. So I would say that the fearlessness came within us. But this bravery would exact a steep price. The character of the Mohawk Skywalker soon would be tested in a tragedy of epic proportion. By the dawn of the 1900s, iron workers were put to the test in the erection of huge new bridges and towering high-rises that now reached up dozens of stories. Although never more than a small proportion of the ethnically diverse iron workers, the Mohawk Indians' reputation for fearlessness brought them widespread renown. One project sure to add to their legend was the world's longest cantilever bridge designed to reach 1,800 feet spanning the St. Lawrence River near Quebec. 
In 1907, nearly every able-bodied Mohawk ironworker was employed on the mammoth job. Theodore Cooper's risky design called for supports on the bridge's underside to shoulder the weight of construction until the sides were joined at the middle. On August 27th, one of his field engineers, a fellow by the name of McClure, reported that there was some severe bending in the bridge in the bottom cords and also other structural members. The young engineer immediately ordered all work halted and raced to New York to alert Cooper. What McClure didn't know, that as soon as he left town, the superintendent for the bridge company ordered work to resume. On August 29th, near quitting time, 92 men were wrapping up work on the bridge when the moan of ripping steel echoed off the river. There was a loud noise, the squealing of the steel shifting, and everybody who was on that ridge knew what was happening because, of course, they had discussed the fact that it, it wasn't quite uh, set up properly, and so people knew that it was going down. The men hollered, the bridge is falling. They all tried to run to the shore, but in a matter of seconds, 600 feet of this cantilevered section, over 20,000 tons of structural steel, that's 40 million pounds of structural steel when crashing into the St. Lawrence River. In seconds, the huge bridge section plunged from sight. The deafening crash was heard for miles. Those not drowned immediately were left to die slowly of their wounds, trapped in the tons of twisted steel wreckage beyond reach of rescue. Of the 75 men lost, 33 were from the tiny Ganawaga Mohawk Reservation. When the news came into the the community it spread very quickly and I remember hearing people talk about how there were uh, 20 or 30 uh, bodies or, or hearses that came into the community all at one time in order to commemorate and to make sure that nobody ever forgot what happened there were crosses that were built out of steel for the men never again would Mohawk men flock to a single project the women of the community decreed that for them to continue in such a deadly trade, they would have to split up to prevent such tragedy from ever revisiting the reservation. Before the last bodies were buried, surviving Mohawk Skywalkers were already en route to Manhattan. Although Chicago had seen the birth of the high rise, New York City was where it would reach its zenith. Beginning with the 22-story Flatiron Building built in 1902, the Big Apple skyline soon boasted so many steel-reinforced towers that some feared the sun would be blocked from view. The Woolworth Tower raised the ante to 792 feet, making it the world's tallest building on completion in 1913. A new term was coined to describe these colossal structures. Soon, New Yorkers were craning their necks to behold the skyscraper. Daredevils exploited the newfound obsession with the tall building, flirting with death and hair-raising stunts. But for the iron worker, this kind of risk was no gimmick. Pedestrians gazing upward developed a fascination with the men who walk the skies every day for a living. If you or on the street level and see some guy 300 foot in the air walking around on steel beams, you automatically have the thought that guy's going to be crazy to be up there. Uh, he falls, he's going to get killed. That's where the fascination comes in. Because they, they say to themselves, I could never walk up there like that. Look at that, look at that. The men who raised the skyscrapers quickly became icons of the industrial age. Photographer Lewis Hines was particularly captivated with the iron worker. His celebrated images of the men laboring at dizzying height reflected his awe for the high steel man. He wrote, some of them are heroes, all of them persons it is a privilege to know. Hines and his camera would follow as iron workers went to work on a project that would become the ultimate expression of the skyscraper form. The Empire State Building was designed to stand as a soaring representation of New York's financial and cultural vitality. As such, 
the Art Deco Tower had to reach higher than any man-made structure on Earth. Conceived at the height of Jazz Age optimism and hubris, the project would be carried out amid the grim reality of the Depression. Ground was broken on St. Patrick's Day, 1930, six months after the stock market crash sent America into financial despair. As iron workers began setting in the first of the 44-ton columns, they knew that they were lucky to be working at all. Many took great risks to keep their gangs on schedule and themselves in a job. With that kind of motivation, the steel framing shot up at a rate of five floors per week, a blistering pace even by modern standards. 60,000 tons of steel columns and beams were attached to reach one quarter mile into the sky, 102 floors in all. Binding all the iron together was the rivet gang. The rivet gang usually consisted of four men. You would have a heater who would heat the rivets in a portable forge. He would toss them to the catcher, who would catch them in a bucket type funnel, who would then hand them to uh, the bucker up, would place it in the hole, and the bucker up would back up the rivet while the other fella with a pneumatic hammer would drive the rivet in place and, and then round over the other end of the rivet, and, and, and this would make a solid connection at that, uh, at that point. Woe to the careless worker who would occasionally catch a red-hot rivet in the arm or face. But on the Empire State Building, as on all high iron, no man would be more at risk than the ultimate Skywalker, the connector. The iron worker connector has always been considered the macho man or the creme de la creme, the cowboy of the sky, the last of the mountain men of the iron working industry. As the member of the steel raising gang tasked with scaling the columns at the very top of the building to connect them with the incoming beam, the connector could find himself leaning out into space hundreds of feet above the unforgiving concrete. If you're working on the outside, if you make one mistake, you're going over, uh, down to the street. Faced with this prospect, the men recall the iron worker motto, one hand for the company, one hand for yourself. On the Empire State Building, these treacherous conditions combine with the desperate employment situation to create a ghoulish spectacle. For every person employed in that job, there was 10 people looking to have his job. And every day outside the gates, as many as 100, 150 people would be waiting for an opportunity to go to work. If somebody would fall, there was somebody there to take their place. The vultures would not be disappointed. Seven men would fall to their death from the building before it was completed on May 1st, 1931. On many jobs, the toll would be even greater. Contractors of this era callously calculated that on average, for each million dollars budgeted for a building, one man would die. Bridges proved even more deadly. The notorious loss of life building the great spans of the day had led to the morbid adage, the bridge demands its life. When plans were announced for the world's longest suspension bridge, spanning San Francisco's churning Golden Gate, many braced for the worst. Throughout the 1930s, the bleak U.S. economy led iron workers on a coast-to-coast -coast search for employment. The migratory tradition that continues to this day is known as booming out. During the Depression, the men often rode the rails, hopping freight cars from point to point. The travel was often as hazardous as any job. In the uh, rail cars, you had murderers, you had uh, uh, cutthroats, you had prostitutes, you had just about every type of individual <laughs> in the freight cars, and uh, so they had to really watch out. One job that drew iron workers from all over the United States was the Golden Gate Bridge. The largest bridge project in history was designed to stretch the mile-wide mouth of San Francisco Bay. To meet the demands of spanning the busy shipping lanes, 
a massive suspension bridge was conceived with twin 750-foot towers shouldering the weight of the roadway and traffic. In all, over 25,000 pencil-thin wires would be spun back and forth across saddles at the tower tops and compressed into three and a half foot suspension cables that would form the backbone of the bridge. From the beginning, the endeavor promised to be costly in terms of iron worker lives. Builder Joseph Strauss was well aware of the hazards of bridge building, but considered the predictions of a steep body count on his project to be appalling and unthinkable. From the outset, he insisted upon unprecedented safety measures to protect the men as they worked. Crude leather helmets made their first appearances on the Golden Gate, as did the safety belts designed to keep workers tethered closely to the bridge. When riveters began collapsing within the tower catacombs, Strauss quickly had the problem traced to lead poisoning caused by the floating particles of lead paint oxidized with each setting. Riveters and painters were immediately required to don respirators to protect them from the fumes. But Strauss's greatest life-saving innovation was the huge net that hung beneath his bridge. Costing nearly $100,000, the net stretched 10 feet ahead of the advancing span and 10 feet to either side. The net proved to be a, uh, a terrific lifesaver and uh, inspired the men's confidence. The men who went into the net, some of them were hurt severely, but they lived. 94-year-old Alfred Zampa, the last surviving builder of the Golden Gate, was among those to benefit from this unheard of safety measure. The net, that was the greatest, you know. <clears throat> you never even heard of that before. That, to me, Looks like night and day. You had a net on there, nothing to worry about, no, nothing to fear. On October 20th, 1936, Zampa became the third man to accidentally fall into the giant net when he slipped on a wet girder. I stepped out too far. Just stepped out and kept. I flipped three, I, I, I know I flipped three times. Then it's you didn't have time to get scared. It happened so fast, so quick. But I wasn't a, a bit afraid. I figured that net was going to catch me. But for Zampa, the loose mesh proved a mixed blessing as it sagged toward the rocky shallows before stopping his fall. Well, it caught me right, but it was on the ground, on rocks. You know, so, 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 so the side, the rocks up there. Badly injured in the impact, Zampa would spend 12 weeks in St. Luke's Hospital recovering in a body cast. While there, he christened the growing club of men whose lives had been saved by the net. We talked about, you know, the name, we said, halfway to hell and back. I said, no, we never did come back. I said, we never had went to hell yet. So we said, it's just halfway to hell, that's good enough. The ranks of the Halfway to Hell Club would eventually swell to 19 men. But the obsession with safety could not prevent Joseph Strauss's worst nightmare from coming true. On February 17, 1937, a traveler scaffold was beneath the deck, pulling wood bracing off during the final phase of construction. Unbeknownst to the 12 men perched on top, a similar scaffold had been condemned by inspectors the previous day. Suddenly, a deafening crack was heard as the 10-ton platform ripped free of its brackets. Many of the men fell directly into the net, but to their horror, the scaffold followed them down, tearing the mesh and dragging the doomed ironworkers into the ocean 250 feet below. Only two of the workers were pulled from the water alive. Ironically, Many of the ten victims were pulled under by the net that had been hung to save their lives. Finally it went down. And the tide was going out to the ocean. And some of them drowned, wrapped up like fish, you know. In spite of the tragedy, 
the Golden Gate was considered a towering triumph at her opening on May 27, 1937. For the men who built her, the pride in their accomplishment is undimmed by six decades. I love being there. I would have worked down there for nothing. That's how much I love this Golden Gate. I knew it was going to be a bridge, and I knew I was going to be famous for a little while. Within four years, most civilian construction ground to a standstill. In the wake of Pearl Harbor, America's iron and iron workers were sent to war. During World War II, combat construction battalions, better known as CBs, particularly needed the skills of the iron worker. During carrier battles in the Pacific Theater, Naval iron workers would be asked to repair crippled flat tops as enemy planes continued their attacks. When the veterans returned home following VJ Day, their need for homes, schools, and roadways created the boom which saw iron workers pressed to work, raising the expanding suburbs across the country. Only in the late 1950s did a need for more urban space reinvigorate the need for ultra-tall buildings. As iron workers returned to work on the new generation of skyscraper, they marked the passing of an era. Rivet gangs were fading from the trade, as cheaper and faster high-strength bolts replaced them as the way to attach beams and columns. As rivets disappeared, another tradition proved more enduring. By the 1950s, the neighborhoods of the Cobble Hill section of Brooklyn bristled with Mohawk iron workers. After 50 years spent raising the Big Apple skyline, working high iron out of New York had become the primary rite of passage for young Mohawks. The tradition of being able to deal with fear, of looking for a good challenge, of always finding a way to prove yourself as a man, that, that fit in perfectly with the, the coming of iron work to our community. In Brooklyn, the bars and coffee shops off Atlantic Avenue became home away from home. These were places where the men would go after work, but it was also much more than that. It became a sort of a clearinghouse. People could find out about jobs in there. They could hear the latest news from home. Like I said, after work, that's where everybody met. The people that you met in the bar were just like uh, your family, you know what I mean? With the second generation Mohawk Skywalkers, nights out in Brooklyn punctuated long days of labor that still could turn perilous in an instant. For Ron Barnes, one of these moments occurred one day above the Port Authority bus terminal when a fellow worker was knocked from a dangling scaffold. He would have been fine, but he was in a hurry to get up and he jumped the wrong way and he fell another 30 feet, busted his neck wide open. The blood was just gushing out, so I slid down a column and uh, I tried to stop the bleeding. Uh, and I stuck my whole finger in his neck. Couldn't find an artery. And the ambulance took about maybe an hour to get there, and he just bled to death. He was a young man, probably 21, 22 years old. The sight of a colleague lost before their eyes was enough to shake even the fearless men of Ganawaga. When your fellow worker fell, if anybody got killed, everybody had to mark off. In other words, to settle the nerves again, you know what I mean? At the beginning, I said we were fearless, but uh, there's always that thought behind your head, too, that uh, you could be the next going in the hole, you know? When you're young like that, it's, uh, things like that don't come to mind. You know, that's, I guess when you're young, you think you're going to live forever, but unfortunately, that's not the case. By the late 1960s, Soaring new structures were carrying iron workers to spine-tingling new heights. The post-war skyscraper explosion hit its peak with two towers of staggering proportions. The men who raised New York's World Trade Center found themselves perched on beams more than 1,300 feet above lower Manhattan. The Empire State Building's four-decade reign as the world's tallest building was at an end. In Chicago, Iron workers edged toward the clouds, pushing the Sears Tower even higher, topping out at 1,454 feet. 
But the era in which each million in a building's budget would be paid for with a man's life was finally passing. Two events had sudden impact on the life expectancy of an iron worker. In 1970, the Occupational Safety and Health Act, better known as OSHA, was passed into law. And that changed everything because OSHA required that contractors do uh, their work in a safe manner and uh, you had inspectors to make sure that happened. The Iron Workers Union also stepped up their crusade to cut back on the steep casualty rate. Next piece of water is in back right there. A rigorous training program was initiated to prepare men for the hazards of high steel. No longer would a novice have to test his nerve for the first time at 50 stories up. Even in our interviewing process, we make them aware that, uh, that quite often you're going to have to work in high places. And if you have a fear of heights or if you're, uh, you, you think that you're a little apprehensive about this, this may not be the job for you. At apprentice schools like this one north of San Francisco, newcomers to the trade are instructed and tested in all aspects of iron work. Future connectors are taught to scale columns and attach beams as they fly in. Bring her down like a lady. For the green apprentices, it is also a time to listen to the hard lessons learned Come by on, veterans. Let's go. Hey, we're not flying a kite up there. Get that iron up in the place. I was looking around at, at some of the guys, the old timers, and the first thing that I noticed was they all seemed to be missing something. A finger, a piece of an ear, they were limping. It scared me. You know, I realized this is no joke. You know, you hear stories, but seeing it. It'll wake you up. Under the gaze of instructors, these men can ready themselves for their first trials on the job site. Once there, they will still face the daunting hazards that no safety gear can prevent. Sometimes you have columns that weigh 10, 11, 12 tons, you know, and it's flying over your head. If you're not focused and not paying attention to what's going on around you, that whip line can snap, and that column can come down on you, and that's it. It takes an apprentice three years, 630 hours of training, and 6,000 hours on the job to rise to the level of journeyman. When a new journeyman does this for real, it is often at the top of a column on top of a sprouting high rise. It's a really dangerous job because you're working with Items that weigh anywhere from 100 pounds to three or four tons. Um, they're, they're flying in attached to a crane over your head. Sometimes they're coming up at you. And you have to be in a position to always account for the unexpected. As a modern raising crew performs the choreographed moves that will raise this downtown San Francisco tower at almost a floor per day, it is under the unblinking eye of a safety officer. Connectors, like the rest of the crew, must tie off, latching their harness to a safety wire whenever more than 30 feet in the air. With their spud wrenches, they can quickly line up the bolted connections, which will later be reinforced. Deckers will quickly fill in corrugated flooring every two levels to prevent workers from plunging down the building's core. Although the harnesses provide a measure of protection, it is the prospect of a fall from a perimeter beam that still looms in the back of every connector's mind. You're pretty much dead. For me, that somewhat alleviates the fear because there's, there's no quadriplegic or you might make it. You fall that far, it's all over. The risk does have its rewards. You get a sense of accomplishment, a sense of something. You, you put something up that's going to be there for at least, you know, 100 years. Just across San Francisco Bay, Another group of iron workers walk a precarious beat to ensure that the Golden Gate Bridge sees its 100th anniversary. To protect the Grand Bridge from the elements, these men will go to any length or height. If we were on a building downtown, that would compare to about a 65, 70-story building. Here, you can start out at 745 feet with nothing underneath you, but, the, but a roadway at 500 feet. That's a, that's a long ways to go before you stop. In their endless fight with the corrosion that will weaken the Great Bridge, 
These Golden Gate iron workers constantly inspect and repair sections of the cable, deck, and towers. On the slippery suspension cables, sure-footedness is a survival skill. The scariest part, uh, I, it's just making sure that you're not moving too fast, that you're not getting too comfortable, where you might get in a, a position that's unsafe. Safety, again, is pivotal to doing the job. Walking the cables, we'll use the two lanyards with the snap hooks, and then we're constantly hooked into the safety cables. Uh, as we get to each stanchion, which is the vertical rod that's holding the cable, we unhook one individually to make sure that you never unhook completely. To these men, it is the job of a lifetime and a role few associate with that of iron workers. But in recent years, high iron men across the country have been called into new roles to meet unexpected challenges. For iron workers in Oklahoma City, the ruins left by a terrorist bomb would challenge them to answer the call, to assist in one of the deadliest rescues ever attempted. Despite today's vigilant attention to safety and training, the iron worker must continue to place himself in harm's way to do his job. Structural collapse and equipment failure are ever-present threats. In recent years, iron workers have been increasingly called to put themselves at risk far from the job site. When disaster strikes, their unique skills can spell the difference between life and death. In April 1995, iron workers were put to the ultimate test when a massive terrorist bomb rocked the Alfred P. Murrah Federal Building in Oklahoma City. Although built to be blast resistant, the explosion devastated the nine-story structure. Almost immediately, iron workers were on the site, volunteering to brace the teetering building. When I got there, it couldn't have been 25, 30 minutes at the most after the bomb had actually went off. Fires and smoke was everywhere. Trees were on fire. There were still people in the automobiles that it had killed. There was a big crater right in front of the uh, Social Security office, and they were bringing people out of the building at that time. I don't believe that anybody can be prepared for what they were going to see down there unless you come out of a war here to ship recently. The shock hit close to home for the men who had built the Murrah building two decades before. The first thing I thought of whenever I looked at it, I said, there is my building and look at the mess they made out of it. While iron workers remained outside, barred from entering the fractured building, rescue teams struggled through the rubble to reach the scores of trapped survivors. The perilous instability of the wrecked building threatened to add rescuer lives to the body count. Really, to be honest with you, I did not think that the building would stand up. I thought it would eventually go ahead and fall in, cave on in the rest of the way. If you look at the building with any type of expertise, you knew the integrity of the building was completely gone. It was in doubt. And going in, I knew that you know, there was a possibility of, of getting killed in it. Uh, but those people needed help bad and fast. Throughout the day, frustrated paramedic and search teams labored, making little headway inside the teetering ruins. Finally, an army of 54 iron workers was allowed to enter the Murrah building. In the face of a complete cave-in, the unpaid volunteers understood the risks they were about to confront. I kind of avoided my own personal safety. I just kind of said, okay, if it's God's will, I'll, I will just, I'll just die right in here with the rest of them. And I just carried a pipe on in there and welded them in. As work began to reinforce each of the vital structural columns with beams and piping, iron workers and rescuers realized the consequences of even the smallest misstep. We had to be very accurate because if we would have made a mistake, then the whole building would have come in. So there was no, no room for error. The margin of error was life and death. 
a mistake could have been extremely costly to the iron worker and to the firefighter that was present. Uh, a false move, um, something not properly uh, rigged, could have lost its grip and could have caused catastrophic failure, especially the first three days. I know it was a life and death situation. I know that every iron worker down there knew it was a life and death situation. That's why we did it. The scene that always sticks in my mind was all the red arrows. Uh, you would see red arrows pointing down to some rubble, and it would have one, two, three, four, five, something like that on it. And of course, we all knew what that meant. That was three or four bodies there. As we worked and as we cleared the way for the rescue workers, then they started carrying out people, and they would be on these gurneys, and they had been crushed to the point where, you know, hardly anything left of them. We had to set our uh, work area right next to the little kids' playground. And, you know, you'd be sitting there welding and, and, and cutting and stuff, and you'd look over and see a little tricycle or a little toy, and it, it'd bring home, you know, actually what you were doing and the purpose for being there. As work continued on the bracing, the hazardous job of clearing the hundreds of tons of rubble fell to the riggers, who worked in concert with five cranes to remove the massive slabs of concrete and steel that still blocked the search and recovery effort. It's worse than a three-ring circus. There's a five-ring circus, and all five rings have tigers, and all five rings have no fences. If they would have bumped the building with the weight they were moving, it would have been catastrophic. It makes me short of breath to go back and look at and try to remember what your eyes were seeing and watching all these things happen at the same time together. After 14 days, thousands of tons of debris were cleared and six survivors freed from the rubble. For some, reflection proved as difficult as the job itself. I never really thought about it, the horrific things that I'd seen, until after I left the job. Uh, I went home and I started shaking like a leaf. I was, I was, you know, my nerves had let go. And, uh, you know, I cried, because I realized what really went on there. And, and what those people must have went through. It was, it was something you can't explain. In the aftermath of the disaster, the iron workers remain unsung heroes. But for those who were inside the Murrah building, the courage of the volunteers remains an inspiration. They are my heroes. I have to stop when I've done talks at dinners and tell them who made us look good, the fire service look good, that we all didn't get to see was the iron workers. The character of the iron worker working at the Murrah building humbled me. We didn't really consider ourselves heroes, but what we wanted to be known is that we did our share, that we, we went in there and, and tried to help as much as we possibly could. I would hope the legacy of the iron workers would be we answer the call. Uh, we were there when we were needed, and uh, I don't think it'll ever be forgotten. In a world filled with natural and man-made disasters, it is inevitable that the skills and courage of the iron worker will help them answer the call in future moments of crisis. One unique flight of the space shuttle offered a further glimpse of the future for the iron worker. 180 miles in orbit, astronauts Jerry Ross and Woody Spring raised the highest steel of all, assembling a 90-foot tower in a construction trial for the upcoming multinational space station. Back on Earth, the men were made honorary members of the Iron Workers Union. But whether 100 miles or 100 feet above the ground, the Iron Workers of the next century will share a bond with the men who have gone before them. From the steel-nerved Mohawk Skywalkers whose legend was forged in tragedy to the intrepid bridgemen who spanned the Golden Gate, it is fearlessness and fortitude that bind these men together. To me, it's the grandest, the greatest. You have to be somebody. Everybody can't do it. You got to be special. You got the inside. You pull the iron, you iron inside.
For on the superstructures of tomorrow, as on the earliest trestles, one thing remains unchanged by time and technology. To sculpt swinging iron into the skyline of the future, it still comes down to a brave man on a narrow beam.